What is the Four Noble Truths? The Truth About Suffering. Have you ever felt as though you were searching for something intangible, something unknown, yet keenly aware of its absence? This is a question that many of us ponder, although not everyone takes the time to sit down and reflect upon it. Why do we still feel dissatisfied, even when we have the best of everything? We are not entirely happy even if we have a beautiful home, a car, a perfect marriage, wonderful children, and all the rest. We certainly won't be content when we lack all these things. When we don't have them, we think, well, if I had the best of everything, then I would be satisfied. But we won't be. There remains an emptiness, an indescribable feeling, a longing for something far beyond and deeper than what money can buy or achievements can obtain. Because if we were content, we wouldn't question things and wouldn't have the why. And why not? In Buddhism, there's a concept that describes this, known as dukkha. Dukkha is often translated as suffering, but it goes beyond just physical pain to include dissatisfaction, unease, and the imperfection of life. It's an inevitable part of life that each of us must confront. Part 1. What is the essence of Buddhism? The Buddha once said, Both I and you have had to tread through this endless cycle of samsara because we have not found and comprehended the four truths. What are these four truths? They are the truth of suffering, dukkha, the truth of the origin of suffering, samudaya, the truth of the cessation of suffering, niroda, and the truth of the path to the cessation of suffering, Maga, quoted from the Diga Nikaya 16. The most fundamental and important doctrine of Buddhism is dependent origination, the Four Noble Truths, and the Noble Eightfold Path. These three doctrines are the foundation for all schools of early Buddhism as well as Mahayana Buddhism. In the previous chapter, we have explored what is dependent origination. Today, we continue with the next important doctrine, which is the Four Noble Truths, meaning the Four Truths. The Four Truths are sometimes referred to as the Four Noble Truths or the Four Holy Truths. The Sanskrit word Satya means truth. Arya Satya means noble truth or holy truth. The word Arya means noble. The word truth in Sino-Vietnamese consists of the word for speech and the word for king. Noble truth means the mysterious truth. The four noble truths, Katvari Aryasatya, are four very important, mysterious, and true facts. The four noble truths were the first formal teaching of the Buddha after his enlightenment, which is still recorded today. And we will see, these are the fundamental points of the Buddha's teaching. The first sermon. After attaining enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, the Buddha thought of teaching. He knew that the practice was not aimed at liberation for himself alone, but also for the liberation of all people and other sentient beings. The Buddha stayed at the Bodhi tree for quite a long time, several weeks to experience the state of peace and freedom of an enlightened being. At the same time, he also considered how to share his wisdom with everyone, including his parents, relatives, and those who were suffering or would suffer. During this time, the Buddha was in the village of Uruvela, interacting with the villagers, both adults and children. He shared his realizations with the patrons who supported him in those weeks. The first formal sermon he gave was in a grove called the Deer Park Sarnath, north of Varanasi, Benares. He taught it to his five former ascetic friends, including Kandana. Initially, the Buddha wanted to meet his two former teachers. He thought that if he could meet the teachers who had taught him about the four jhanas and the four formless states, he could help them quickly attain the state of Arahant. However, after inquiring, he learned that both teachers had passed away, 
so he decided to seek out the five friends with whom he had practiced asceticism before. Previously, when they saw him abandon the ascetic practices and begin eating and drinking normally, they were disappointed. They thought he had given up and quit, so they left him. Believing he could help them, he crossed the river to the north to reach the deer park. Upon the Buddha's arrival, his five former friends did not want to meet him. This very Siddhartha has given up. Why is he coming here now? Therefore, they did not welcome him warmly as before. However, when they saw his demeanor and aura as he entered, they could not continue to be indifferent. Each of them spontaneously came forward to greet him warmly. One fetched water for him to wash his feet, another held his bowl and robe, another took his cloak, and everyone sat down around him. Then he said, Friends, I will teach you the path to liberation. The five friends asked, Siddhartha, how can you teach us the path when you have abandoned your spiritual quest? The Buddha replied, I have attained enlightenment and can teach you. The others asked again to be sure if the Buddha had truly attained enlightenment, and the Buddha said, Friends, you know me well. Have I ever lied to you? No, Siddhartha, you have never lied to us. Have I ever claimed to be enlightened before? Now I say I have attained the path. I am enlightened and I will teach you. Upon hearing this, all five former friends knelt down, ready to listen to the Buddha. This sermon is considered the first sermon discussing the Four Noble Truths recorded in the Dhammakakapavatana Sutta, the setting in motion of the Wheel of Dharma. The Wheel of Dharma is the teaching wheel, and turning the Wheel of Dharma means to start spinning the wheel of the teaching. The Wheel of Dharma was always there, but it needed to be turned. The Buddha's first sermon was like the act of grabbing the wheel of Dharma and forcefully turning it, and from that moment on, the wheel of Dharma has continued to turn. To this day, the wheel of Dharma is still in motion. Dhamma Chakra Pravartana means the wheel of Dharma is always turning. Four Truths This sutra exists in many versions, in Pali, Chinese, and Sanskrit. One of the Chinese versions is the Buddha speaks of the turning of the wheel of Dharma Sutra, Sutra number 110 in the Taisho Tripitaka. The turning of the wheel of Dharma. Sutra is Dharma Kakra Pravartana. Pravartana meaning turning, Dharma Kakra being the wheel of Dharma. This sutra discusses four mysterious truths, four noble truths. In English, it is called the four noble truths. In this sutra, the Buddha talks about four truths. There is suffering. There is the origin of suffering. There is the cessation of suffering. There is the path leading out of suffering. The emperor of suffering, the noble truth of the origin, the noble truth of cessation, the noble truth of the way, dukkha, samudaya, niroda, marga. The truth of suffering, Dukkha is the first truth that we must realize and learn. Dukkha, which means inability to satisfy or unsatisfactory, dissatisfied, suffering or affliction, broadly speaking, is what makes us uncomfortable. The noble truth of the origin, that is, gathering together, of the causes that lead to suffering, the physical and mental foods that have been consumed and have led to suffering. That is the second truth that needs to be recognized and transformed. The third truth is the noble truth of cessation. Cessation here is the absence, the elimination of the causes that have led to suffering. And the fourth truth is the noble truth. Tao means path. Which path? The path leading to the destruction of the causes of suffering is also known as the Noble Eightfold Path. Part 2 The First Truth What is the Truth of Suffering? Whether Buddhas appear or not, that suffering still exists. It is still something immutable from ancient times to thousands of years later. 
Buddha is not the creator or originator of this truth. That truth is something that is available. The Buddha is just the one who discovered and realized that truth and then preached it to sentient beings. The first truth is the truth of suffering, Dukkha Saka. Dukkha is a word that is very difficult to translate into any other language. People often translate Dukkha as suffering or affliction. However, suffering or affliction can only express a few attributes and qualities of Dukkha. Relatively complete, accurate, and complete about Dukkha, we can roughly understand as follows. All these physiological changes in the body that lead to pain, weakness, illness, old age, and death are Dukkha. All changes and changes in psychological states such as love, hate, resentment, sadness, depression, despair, hatred are all Dukkha. In an abstract philosophical sense, anything that is difficult to endure, unsatisfactory, unsatisfactory, difficult to endure, is Dukkha. D means difficult, Ka means to endure. In broad terms, it means anything that makes you uncomfortable. The essence of the Buddha's teachings. What is Dukkha? So, what is the truth of suffering? The Buddha attained enlightenment and preached in the Dhammakakapavatana Sutta with a succinct statement. Birth is suffering. Aging is suffering. Illness is suffering. Death is suffering. Not getting what one wants is suffering. Encountering what one dislikes is suffering. Separation from what one loves is suffering. In summary, the five aggregates subject to clinging are suffering. Most understand the truth of suffering as the eight sufferings, including all eight mentioned above. But that's not all. The content of this passage points out the seven sufferings in the first part to see the truth of suffering which is the presence of suffering in the seven situations above, while the latter part summarizes the five aggregates are suffering to know the truth of suffering. Seeing the truth of suffering. In this world, except for those who have awakened to the Dharma as skillfully taught by the Tathagata, virtually everyone else, regardless of age, gender, wealth, intelligence, ethnicity, or religion experiences these seven types of suffering. Everyone born into this world inevitably encounters suffering, whether living for a few years or several decades. Life often feels like it contains little joy, much sorrow, and even greater danger. Being born means everyone will age, and with aging comes frequent pain, slow movement, blurred vision, diminished memory, even confusion, and no one is exempt from this suffering. Being born means having a body, and the Buddha stated the truth. Whoever thinks this body will not fall ill is deluded, and when ill, everyone feels the presence of suffering. Being born means death will come, and the approach of death is a terrifying fear. That is, death is suffering indeed. Humans always long for material and spiritual happiness found in beauty, fame, scent, taste, gentle touch, so they seek here and there. When they fail to achieve what they desire, suffering arises. When achieved, they cling to it, hoping it lasts forever. But its impermanent nature leads to decay, destruction, loss, and suffering arises. This is the suffering of not getting what one desires, and no one is exempt. Hating or despising something, be it objects, phenomena, people, information, will also give rise to suffering, which is a universal truth of human life, known as the suffering of encountering what is loathed. Love and separation bring suffering to everyone, known as the suffering of separation from what one loves, this is seeing the truth of suffering, a multi-dimensional, comprehensive view of suffering, a universal truth for all humanity, excluding none, whether a powerful president, the world's wealthiest billionaire, a prisoner, a beggar, a person with disabilities or of outstanding intelligence. All sentient beings are equal in suffering, 
except for the enlightened beings. However, worldly beings see suffering unilaterally, perceiving only the poor, sick, uneducated, or failures as suffering, while those who are wealthy, successful, powerful, or famous are not seen as suffering. Knowing the truth of suffering, that is, the five aggregates are suffering. This means clinging to the five aggregates as mine, as me, as myself, will give rise to suffering. Specifically, ignorance, delusion, wrong view, attachment to form, feeling, perception, mental formations, or consciousness as mine, as me, as myself, will cause suffering to arise, not that the five aggregates themselves are suffering. Therefore, suffering is conditionally arisen, and the path of conditional arising to suffering is summarized in the 12 links of dependent origination. Due to contact, there is feeling. Due to feeling, there is craving. Due to craving, there is clinging. Due to clinging, there is becoming. Due to becoming, there is birth, aging, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, and despair. Contact, feeling, craving, clinging, becoming, suffering. If described in full detail, the path of conditional arising to suffering is the path of the eight wrong practices of worldly beings. Contact, feeling perception, wrong mindfulness, wrong thinking, consciousness with wrong views, greed, hatred, delusion, wrong concentration, desire, wrong effort, unwholesome mental formation, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, birth, aging, illness, death, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. In this path of the eight wrong practices, consciousness with wrong views is the thought of clinging to the five aggregates as mine, as me, as myself, which are precisely the five aggregates. Suffering arises on the path of the eight wrong practices. So, suffering belongs to the realm of the mind and does not exist in the external world as worldly beings understand. Suffering, as a conditionally arisen phenomenon, has the nature of impermanence, ownerlessness, non-possession, or non-self, meaning there is no self as the owner or possessor of suffering, which is the meaning of non-self. In the Samyutta Nikaya, the issue of suffering being impermanent, ownerless, or non-self was clearly addressed through a dialogue between a Brahmin and the Buddha. The Brahmin asked, is suffering caused by oneself and born by oneself? Meaning, is there a Mr. A who is the owner and creator of the cause of suffering and also the owner of the suffering that he has created from the past? The Buddha replied, not so, that is eternalism. Meaning, due to not truly understanding that suffering has the nature of impermanence and non-self, anatta, worldly beings fail to see that the term Mr. A refers to the arising and ceasing processes of the five aggregates, serving to distinguish this set of aggregates as A from another set as B, but not implying the existence of an unchanging eternal entity, Mr. A from the past to the present and future, as the owner, the creator of the cause of suffering, and the bearer of the suffering. Such understanding by worldly beings is called eternalism. The Brahmin then asked, is suffering then caused by others and born by oneself? For example, suffering as punishment from God for the sins of Adam and Eve, suffering from ancestors in the spiritual world, punishing their descendants like the saying, the father eats salty, the son thirsts, or the sins of the father are visited upon the son. The Buddha replied, not so, that is, annihilationism. The Brahmin continued, So, there is no suffering. The Buddha replied, There is suffering. I have seen suffering. I know suffering. The Brahmin asked, Where is suffering then? 
The Buddha replied, suffering arises due to contact, meaning suffering is a conditionally arisen phenomenon due to the contact of sense base and object leading to the arising according to the path of the eight wrong practices. Hence, it is impermanent, not permanent, not residing in the material external world as materialism, eternalism conceives, nor is it a reward or punishment from God or the spiritual world as idealism, annihilationism conceives. It is ownerless, non-possessed, meaning there is no one, no creator, no I, no self who creates or bears, owns suffering, which is the meaning of non-self, anatta. The three types of suffering, suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and suffering of conditioning. What are they? For instance, illness as suffering should be understood as follows. Due to the lack of correct understanding that a state of health is an impermanent, non-self-pleasant feeling, one delights in and clings to the state of health as mine, as me, wanting it to last forever. Therefore, when illness comes, suffering arises as the state of health. The pleasant feeling disappears, leading to sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair. This suffering is known as the suffering of change, pertaining to the mind and not the external world, and it is the suffering of not getting what one wants. When the pleasant feeling is lost, the thing clung to as mine, as me, the clinging to the feeling aggregate, is replaced by the feeling of suffering, pain. Irritation with this feeling of suffering arises, which is the suffering of encountering what is disliked. This suffering is called the suffering of suffering. It is mental, not external. When in such pain, there is also the fear of death, thoughts of seeking and hopes of curing the illness, thus sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair arise. This suffering is called the suffering of conditioning. Thus, due to clinging to health, clinging to death as mine, as me, clinging to the feeling aggregate, clinging to the formation's aggregate, physical suffering arises and mental suffering of change, suffering of suffering and suffering of conditioning emerges. Another example, a grandmother due to clinging to the form, feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness of her grandchild as mine, as me, experiences sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress and despair when the grandchild dies in an accident. However, because she does not cling to the form, feeling, perception, mental formations and consciousness of the neighbor's child as mine, as me, the death of the neighbor's child in an accident does not cause her sorrow, lamentation, pain, distress and despair. A young man, although acquainted with but not in love with a girl, does not have the thought of clinging, thinking the girl, her parents, her siblings as mine, as me, so he does not feel happy when they are happy nor suffers when they suffer. But when he falls in love with and marries the girl, he immediately clings to the girl along with her parents and siblings as mine, as me, and thus he will share in their happiness and suffer in their suffering. In summary, the five aggregates as suffering is as described. Part 3. Triple Turning. Twelve Aspects. Three Propositions and Twelve Direct Understandings. Each truth has three propositions, thus forming twelve direct understandings. In the Theravada tradition, attaining the state of an arahant, one who has fully understood the Four Noble Truths with three propositions and twelve direct understandings, is considered to have realized the truth. Proposition 1. Recognition The first is recognition, meaning recognizing suffering. This is truly my suffering. If you want to help a friend, you say, this is truly your suffering. Do you see it? The first task of a doctor is to let the patient know they are ill. 
and the patient must acknowledge their illness for the doctor to be able to cooperate. Recognizing suffering does not come out of nowhere. It requires knowledge, experience, and practice. One must listen and observe carefully to recognize their true suffering. Proposition 2. Understanding. The second action is understanding, saying, this suffering I wish to fully understand. To fully understand means to comprehend thoroughly. Knowing that one has the disease, it is necessary to see the nature of the disease clearly. What are the symptoms? How severe has it become? How does the disease manifest in the morning, at noon, in the evening? How does it reveal itself during sleep? This is a full understanding of suffering, having recognized it, but one must explore it further. This is the second action that turns the wheel of Dharma further, called the second turning. Proposition 3. Realization, understanding the nature. The third is realization which is experiencing that this suffering has been fully understood. Here, realization means having practiced, seen, and fully understood the suffering. The first turn leads to the second, and the second leads to the third. In summary, regarding the first truth, one must go through three stages of practice. The first stage of practice is recognition. The second stage of practice is the deep desire to understand, to transform, and the third is understanding the nature, the characteristics of the pain and suffering. This is the triple turn. For the second truth, the origin of suffering, there is also a triple turn. First is the practice of recognizing the immediate and distant causes that lead to suffering. Contemplation is needed to see the contributing factors. With the help of teachers and friends, one can contemplate more clearly. This is the formation of suffering. Because I eat this, I drink that, my ears hear this sound, my eyes see that sight, I consume these foods every day, so now I have this disease, this pain and suffering. This must be seen as a practice. The second, the encouragement to turn, is the initiation of the intention to eliminate those causes. I know my body is sick and in pain because I have eaten this way, drunk that way, slept that way, worked this way. Now, I must stop eating like that, stop drinking like that, stop living that daily life in such a manner. This aspect needs to be eliminated, which is the encouragement to turn of the second truth. If that desire is not strong enough, one will never be able to eliminate suffering. The desire to eradicate the seeds of suffering must be very strong. One must be determined to end it. Following that, the realization turn is the actual realization that this origin has been eliminated. Cessation also has three turns. Cessation is the absence of suffering, that is, happiness, which is acknowledging the presence of peace. Before, we did not bear the suffering we are bearing now. Around us, there are people who do not bear this suffering. This is acknowledging the state of being healthy, the condition of liberation, peace, happiness. If we cannot recognize suffering, we do not have the capability to eliminate suffering. A person with a headache, acknowledging they have a headache, is the first truth. Then acknowledging the reason why they have a headache is the second truth. Acknowledging that there is a state of not having a headache which one has experienced in the past and will experience in the future if one undergoes treatment Acknowledging there are people around who do not have a headache is the third truth. This peace, this truth about cessation, needs to be realized, needs to be actualized. I want to return to the old state of peace. I want to live in a state of peace like you, because you do not have the disease like I do. That is the encouragement to turn. And the third, the realization turn, is the state of disease being eradicated has been experienced. Here, I have reached peace. I no longer have a headache. And the path also involves three turns. The first turn is seeing this as the path, the method for the cessation of suffering, confirming there is a path, a method, 
recognizing that path and method help us escape suffering and achieve peace. The second turn is that this path needs to be practiced, which is the encouragement to turn. Stirring the desire to practice because we know that only through practice can transformation be achieved. No divine being can practice on our behalf. We must practice ourselves. If we want to reach the destination, we must walk with our own feet. The third is the realization of the path. Having practiced the path naturally, cessation has been realized, the origin has been eliminated, and suffering has been fully understood. In the Buddha's first sermon, we see that the Buddha's teaching is not a religion of worship. Not praying to any divine being for happiness and relief from suffering, we must walk with our own feet on the path towards the cessation of suffering. Each noble truth involves three actions, multiplied by four truths, making twelve. This is called triple turning and twelve aspects. The Buddha told his five disciples, Monks, in the past when I had not fully understood the aspects of suffering, the origin, the cessation, and the path, I did not claim to be fully enlightened. But now, having fully understood the aspect of suffering, I have fully comprehended suffering. I have recognized the origin. I have eliminated the origin. I have recognized cessation. I have realized cessation. I have recognized the path. I have practiced the path. Now I declare that I am fully enlightened. This is a statement in the Dhammakakapavatana Sutta. The Buddha also said, Monks, because I can see by direct knowledge the three turnings and twelve aspects in these four truths, this seeing and this realization brought wisdom, brought light. So I declare before all the deities, all the demons, all the ascetics, all the Brahmins in all the worlds, that I have eradicated all defilements and have been liberated, realizing the state of full enlightenment. This statement is also in the Dhammakakapavatana Sutta. We can see that initially, the five disciples did not believe that the Buddha was enlightened, but later they had to believe that the Buddha was enlightened because he had a profound understanding of the Four Noble Truths, not by intellectual power, but by experience and direct realization, because he had gone through the triple turning, twelve aspects. This repetition emphasizes, monks, before I truly realized the three turnings and twelve aspects of the four truths, I never claimed that I was fully enlightened. But now that I have truly realized the three turnings and twelve aspects of the four truths, I declare before all beings that I am fully enlightened. Truly realizing is a phrase in the sutra, like direct knowledge, knowing not by intellectual power, but knowing by experience, knowing by one's own seeing called direct knowledge. The Four Noble Truths as a Lifelong Inquiry We apply the Four Noble Truths to our self-discipline, we incorporate them into the mundane aspects of life, down to the trivial bindings and obsessions of the mind. With these truths, we can examine our attachments for self-realization. Through the third noble truth, the truth of cessation, we can perceive the elimination and end of suffering and practice the noble eightfold path until we achieve insight. Once the noble eightfold path is fully developed, the practitioner will realize the path and attain the state of an arahant. Four truths, three propositions, twelve direct understandings. These might sound complicated, but they are actually very straightforward. They are tools to help us understand suffering and how to depart from it. In the Buddhist world, many Buddhists are not well informed about the Four Noble Truths. Some say, oh, the Four Noble Truths, that's elementary, and consider it as basic doctrine. That's only for beginners, for children. The higher teachings must be. They then chase after complex theories and thoughts, forgetting the most profound and mysterious Dharma gate. The Four Noble Truths are a lifelong inquiry. It's not just about understanding the Four Noble Truths, the Triple Turning, and the Twelve Aspects three propositions and twelve direct understandings, 
to become an Arahan and settle somewhere, to then move on to a higher realm. The Four Noble Truths are not that simple. They require a constant vigilance because they provide the framework for the examination of an entire life. 